All right, everybody, welcome to our next lesson here. Today we're going to look at Austria and Prussia in the age of absolutism. So we'll be looking at those two countries today and the monarchs that were in uh, control of them. So our objectives and standards to understand how Austria and Prussia became powerful and to analyze the impact of rulers in Austria and Prussia as well. Uh, take a moment there to look over the standards, please. And our desired result, remember to include this in your weekly summary. <clears throat> in what ways were the leaders of Austria and Prussia absolute monarchs? So think about that, uh, what it means to be an absolute monarch and have control, um, and how did uh, the monarchs in these places um, do that? So the results of the Thirty Years' War. So we just kind of talked about the results of the Thirty Years' War. So <clears throat> the German states and the people are going to face difficulty uh, following the Thirty Years' War. However, we're going to see powerful countries and monarchs begin to rise as a result. Uh, two of them are Austria and Prussia that will begin to expand and grow. So the Habsburgs expand. So weakened by the Thirty Years' War, the Habsburgs uh, were determined to create a strong <coughs> excuse me, United State. Now, keeping the title of the Holy Roman Empire, they sought to expand their own lands. Now, Austria was the base of power of the uh, Habsburgs, and they're going to add Bohemia, Hungary, and later on parts of Poland and the Italian states. Now, it was difficult to unite these lands because of geography and different groups of people and cultures, uh, different groups of people and cultures. However, by the 1700s, uh, the Habsburg Empire uh, included many parts where people had their own language, their own political assemblies, their own laws, and their own customs as well. So controlling an empire. Some control was placed over uh, these different groups of people. For example, the uh, they Ger excuse me German-speaking officials were sent to uh, Bohemia and Hungary uh, that helped settle Austrians on those lands, and they also did put down revolts in Bohemia and Hungary. Now the Habsburgs were never really able to establish a centralized uh, government system, a centralized government system like uh, France had. But um, another problem that happens is in the early 1700s, the uh, Habsburg Austria faced a serious threat. So Habsburg Austria is going to face a serious threat in the early 1700s. The problem is there's no male heir, so there's no one to follow or secede Emperor Charles VI. His picture is right up here. Now, Maria Theresa, uh, her picture is down here, his daughter, uh, I'm sorry, that arrow looks a little screwy. Uh, his daughter was intelligent and capable of leading, but no woman had controlled the Habsburg, uh, the Habsburg Empire yet. Now, Charles VI, he's going to convince other European powers to accept her as a leader, which they did. However, after his death, many are going to ignore uh, this agreement. So problems with Prussia. In 1740, shortly after Charles VI's death, uh, Frederick II, his picture right here of Prussia, seized Silesia, which was a rich province of the Habsburg Empire. I believe I'm saying that correctly, uh, Silesia. It sparked the beginning of the eight-year war known as the War of the Austrian Secession, obviously because we're talking about Maria Theresa coming to the throne. Now, Maria Theresa, uh, she immediately sets off for Hungary uh, to ask for help. Now, the Hungarians were not really friendly towards the Habsburgs, but after a speech before an assembly of Hungarian nobles, uh, they agreed to support her, and she's also going to receive support from Great Britain and Russia as well in this war. Now, Maria Theresa, she's not successful at pushing Frederick II out of Silesia, but she did help kind of preserve that empire for her people as well. So rule and reform as an absolute monarch. Maria Theresa was successful at being an absolute monarch. Uh, she did strengthen uh, Habsburg power by restructuring the bureaucracy, uh, the bureaucracy there and improved tax collection. Uh, clergy and the nobles were also forced to pay taxes and she tried to ease the burden of taxes on peasants and labor services. So a little bit of a reformed uh, mind uh, queen there. 
Uh, she also believed her decisions were for the good of her people, but she also did strengthen royal power by limiting the power of the nobles and the clergy as well. So let's talk about Prussia now. Austria was a strong Catholic empire, but Prussia was becoming a strong Protestant nation. Now, the country emerged from the German-speaking north with the Hollenzerns, and I'm trying my best with that, rulers, uh, were taking control in the 1600s. Now, similar to other absolute monarchs, they imposed royal power on their subjects, and they also reduced the independence of nobles known as Junkers. In Prussia, the Hollenzerns set up an efficient central bureaucracy and trained one of the best armies in Europe, and Prussia will have one of the strongest and best known militaries in Europe for many, many years to come. Uh, Frederick Wilhelm I, his picture's right there, came to power in 1713 and limited the power of the nobles uh, by kind of offering them positions in the military to kind of keep their minds busy. Now, by 1740, Prussia will be strong enough to challenge its rival, remember we just talked about this, be uh, strong, enough to able to, uh, strong enough to challenge its rival, Austria, by 1740. So Frederick II leads Prussia. In 1740, uh, young Frederick II became leader of Prussia. Now, prior to this, his father had insisted that Frederick II become trained in the art of the military, but Frederick II, he's more into poetry and music. Now, Frederick Wilhelm I actually punished his son. Uh, Frederick II actually tried to flee the country when he learned that, he, uh, that his father was going to put him into the military. And when his father learned about these plans, he put his son in solitary confinement and actually made him watch the beheading, or the remember, beheading is chopping off their head, of his friend who helped him to try to free, uh, flee the country. And he was only 18 years old when he watched his friend become beheaded. So a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, father-son uh, difficulty there. But eventually Frederick II, who will become known as Frederick the Great, uh, will become an efficient military commander. He does see Silesia from Austria, which we just talked about too, uh, sparked the war of the Austrian secession. And Frederick the Great's power and authority made him an absolute ruler in Prussia. Now, absolute monarch of the arts. Now, Frederick the Great was also a strong supporter of the arts and music. Uh, we know that he was a gifted musician uh, who played the flute. And uh, it's also known or uh, believed that he composed many pieces of music. Um, that seems to be a historical fact there. Uh, Frederick the Great also studied philosophy and read writings and poetry. He supported the environment and agriculture. And Frederick the Great also helped with education and schools in Prussia. So again, just another example of why he's known as Frederick the Great, not just because of his military command and being a strong leader, but also because of his cultural uh, advantages as well. All right, so our closure. In what ways were the leaders of Austria and Prussia absolute monarchs? Think about how Austria and Prussia became uh, established. Think about how the different rulers, such as Maria Theresa and Frederick the Great, uh, controlled their countries. Uh, what did they do to make their governments uh, strong? Any other things they did to kind of help their countries culturally? Um, and that'll help you answer your question. Hope you have a great rest of your day or night. Please let me know of any questions or concerns. Hope to talk to you all soon. Take care. Bye-bye.